New tough. I wanted to come to you to talk about the other aspect that is so challenging with agriculture, and that's the financing part. If you can talk to us about IPS's approach to uh, agribusiness investing uh, and uh, how you decide things, what, what geographies and project types you support, and, and what, in your view, would be the best way to increase investment in agriculture and uh, investment. Thank you, Carol. Um, first of all, let me just uh, give you some background. Uh, I'm part of the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, we operate in more than 30 countries, mainly in Africa and Asia, and um, about 15 countries in Africa. Uh, we have a very holistic approach that development can only take place if you do the economic side, the cultural side, and the social side. So you'll find us in hospitals, schools, you'll find us in cultural things, but you'll also find us in the economic activities. Now, in the economic activity, we are, we are also very, very diverse. Um, we're in uh, aviation, we are in media, we are in tourism, but we are also very, very large in infrastructure and uh, agro-processing. Uh, some of our partners uh, who've been with us are the IFC and the DEG, as Bruno mentioned. Uh, we've been in Africa for more than 100 years now. Uh, what are the sectors that, so in infrastructure, people probably know us from the Bujagali in Uganda or the Sawa Power Project in Kenya or the Azito in Ivory Coast. But in the agro industry, we are also very large. Today, um, we have uh, 150,000 farmers that supply to us 12 months of the year uh, at a guaranteed price on different products. And the different products are processed vegetables, uh, concentrates of fruits, in the leather business, in the meat processing. We are in the Artemisia, which is a medicinal product for malaria fighting that we actually operate in itself. So what kind of model do we have? And uh, you asked how, what are the geographies? I think for us, the approach is more bottom up to say, where are the gaps? And that's where you try and actually move in. So in uh, West Africa, for example, we are in sugar and cotton. Uh, in East Africa, we are in vegetables, in meat, in processed fruits. Uh, the issue for us is that our model is, it's, it's a very simple model. I think the model says farmers are very simple people. What they need is a price before they plant. Number two, a guarantee that you pick up every single kilo that they produce. And most of all, that within a 15-day period, you actually pay them for it. Now, it seems, it, it looks, sounds very simple, but then you ask yourself, why is it not happening in Africa? Because for us, it's worked. We started into farming, not because we wanted to be in farming. We wanted to be in what the minister said, value addition. So for us, we started and said, let's try and add value to the produce of the farmers in Africa. Very soon we found that there were distortions. There were distortions because uh, a, a, a woman would grow cotton, get to the ginnery, and there you'd find a trader. And the trader would say, this is worth 200 shillings, do you want it or not? Obviously the woman accepts it, but she will never grow cotton again. So what we have a model is it's totally integrated fully integrated from farming, for, from giving them all the inputs, giving them all the extension services. This is without any government help at this stage. But the help that we get is from people like DEG, for example. So we operate cotton. We have 50,000 farmers in northern Ivory Coast. Uh, during the 10 years when Ivory Coast was in a shambles, etc., we had to be not just the uh, producer of cotton, but we had to be the hospitals, <coughs> the schools, the rural development in all aspects. And this is where partners like DG came in very useful, where they would give us access to funds that we were able to take care of all the needs of the, of the family. So it's incredible that in 10 years, when we couldn't ship any goods out of Abidjan, we still had 50,000 farmers going and kept that population alive. Uh, Carol, I don't know if that answers some of the things as to the geography itself. Uh, if your question on what needs to be done I think, I think, and okay, I've got some very, uh, I've got three financiers here, so I don't want to go too much in the financing side of it, but what I would say is that I find a lot of money from the World Bank, from other multilaterals, from uh, the NGOs, and the concentration always on that money is on the supply side. How do you produce more? 
I think it's high time that we started working with the people who are in the market side of the, of, of the equation. So for example, if we were in the, I mean, we, we are we're doing some passion fruit concentrate. Today, we, the farmers are growing it on a bush style. If they only had $120 each, they could increase the number of fruits they grow by 400%. Now remember, for, the, for, 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 for us as a company, we do, we, we do not need the money, we do not need those subsidies, but they need to go into the farmers. The issue is people are gonna say, why don't you ask them to go into the microfinance? By the way, our group also has microfinance banks. But I think we, as soon as you start creating layers, and the small scale farmer just moves away from it. But if there was money available, if there was real will to try and do something, then rather than going through governments, rather than going through cooperatives, rather than going through major institutions, it's, it's very simple. Let's try to find something that the farmers can be there. You've got a 100% guaranteed market. So it's not like you're gonna put your money and then you ask them where are you gonna sell it. The question sometimes is asked of us, why don't you give them the money? But our point is that if we do that, we, we lock in farmers. What you want to do is to empower farmers to say, if IPS doesn't buy it at the right price, I can go to Mr. X or Mr. Y. And this is why we need more intervention from the World Bank, from the governments, but without too much of the red tape. I don't know how to say this. I mean, we, we do very large projects as well, so we know the benefit of that. We know the Bujigali, a billion dollar project, what it does. But we also know what agro-industry is about. And I think for that, you need to come right to the ground level. Uh, just for you to know as a group, because we have a very strong social dimension, there are times that we can buy the produce 15% cheaper from large farms. We will not do it. We will still go down the small scale farmer routes because the impact of that on civil society, if you go into those areas, et cetera, is massive. So while very large projects are good and we, are, we, are, we actually do the large projects, I think our greatest strength, and for me personally, is when we have those 150,000 farmers. One company in Kenya alone is, uh, because if you take an average size of eight, looks after one million people out of a population of 40 million. If one company can do it, surely we can scale this up. And it just needs people talking to each other. So in the past, for example, IFC is a shareholder. Does the World Bank engage with us? No, it's the IFC that engages or the DEG and say, do you need any funds? And we are saying we don't need any funds. The farmers they need the, infra, the, the, the funds. And small money, in aggregate, it could be a large enough amount to increase the production several fold. Thank you, Carol. I hope I've answered it. Yes, thank you so much. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.